Um, so my name is Panos. I'm the moderator of, uh, of the panel. Um, when I'm not playing Larry King, my day job is founder and CEO of Sonic Bids. Uh, we're the leading matchmaking platform for uh, bands and uh, promoters to connect around the world. And I'm also chair of the Berkeley College of Music Advisory Council, uh, where I'm leading uh, an entrepreneurship institute that we'll be launching in 2014, focused on music entrepreneurship. Um, so uh, without any further delay, I'll turn it over to my fellow panelists to introduce themselves, and then we'll dive into um, a fun Q&A. Hi, my name is Jim Lucchese. I'm the CEO of the Equinest. Uh, the Equinest is the world's largest, maybe only, music intelligence platform. We power our music discovery applications for most of the leading music services out there. And the company was founded here at the Media Lab. Brian and Tristan both got their PhDs here. Brian's background is in cultural analysis of music, and Tristan's in audio analysis. We combine the two uh, and open them up in a developer API that you guys can hack on this weekend. Uh, hi, I am Kristen Bender. I am the Senior Product Manager of Music uh, for Sonos. I uh, oversee all of our content partner relationships worldwide uh, with music services um, and how they meet our platform. So uh, we do, uh, we are, you know, smart, uh, smart speakers uh, that are powered by software. Um, and so we integrate with music services worldwide. Uh, prior to joining Sonos, I was in the record business for eight and a half years. I worked at Universal Music Group in product development. Uh, prior to that, uh, really opened up the door for uh, uh, relationships with uh, the digital sales uh, channel for, uh, through iTunes, Rhapsody, streaming services uh, at Warner Music Group. Hi, I'm Ron Ubaldo. I graduated from Berkeley College of Music in uh, music, business of, uh, music business management. Uh, I manage direct content partnerships for YouTube Music now. Um, previously, I've specialized in label relations and content ops for Sony Music and Spotify. Cool. OK, thanks, guys. Um, so uh, I grew up in a small country called Cyprus. And I grew up in the 80s. And you know, back then, the only way for me to discover music was primarily from you know, two or three channels. I used to listen to the radio, uh, and I used to listen to this program that was made by the British Armed Forces. That's where I discovered bands like Van Halen and Duran Duran. And I used to watch TV and programs like Top of the Pops. And I know for most of you guys who are not international, these mean nothing. But my point is that there was a few select places where I would go to discover music. It was either TV, um, traditional you know, record retailers, radio, because I grew up in a small island, there wasn't really that much live music from uh, you know, an English-speaking world, so it was mostly bouzouki music for me. But you know, nowadays, all that's been appended. You know, traditional sort of channels like MTV and terrestrial radio, uh, record retailers, gee, I don't know if there's anybody left out there. They're all gone. So my question to, to the panel is, with, with sort of the blowing up of the traditional places where people were going to discover music. Where do you think music discovery is going? I often hear a complaint from people over a certain age, gee, there's no good music created anymore, which is complete hogwash. But I'd like to um, you know, hear, hear the panel's thoughts on how music discovery is evolving, and ultimately, where do you think uh, we're, we're headed? Yeah, I'll kick it Ron, off. Ron, why don't you <laughs> kick it <laughs> off, man? Um, <laughs> You're the last we can have a very yeah. solid panel if you guys want. I've got a lot to say about okay, it. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so when it comes to music discovery, um, we've seen the success of companies like, like YouTube, like Spotify. Um, and it's really become, you know, what's better, uh, algorithmic uh, results or curation? And I think that what we're looking at is a balance where you're refining the algorithms while also tuning into the tastemakers of, of what's new and what's hot. So what we're also seeing is a, a boost in popularity for curating playlists, not just from tastemakers or from artists, but from users. So we're getting a lot of uh, fan and user feedback on uh, what do they like, um, what's trending. Um, I've seen uh, a user who just um, wasn't uh, affiliated with HBO or anything, but uh, curated a, uh, the TV show Girls, curated a playlist for that TV show, and she garnered 30,000 followers just from putting songs from that TV show together in a playlist on Spotify. 
Um, and we've seen similar results uh, on YouTube as well within user channels. So I think that um, uh, to get that balance, not only do you have to refine these algorithms, but um, really tap into um, the users and what they have to say as to what's, what's going to be big. Now, Jim, obviously you guys built a whole business around this. Curious yeah. to get your thoughts. Yeah, so, um, so the Echoness Powers Music Discovery Experience is uh, for RDO, Spotify, many of the music services out there. You touched on one of the things that annoys me the most is this man versus machine argument that, that seems to live in music in almost any type of environment, whether it's production, curation, et cetera. And the most interesting stuff that we're seeing is collaboration between technology platforms and curators. So what we're doing with like Sirius XM, for example, is changing the way radio programmers programming using more data. Um, so the curation and programming side of things is definitely exploding both on the kind of professional side and putting some of those tools in, in, in the hands of fans. Uh, the other area that from a technology standpoint is, is in the very early stages, but I think will become the defining kind of technology challenge over the next five years is in understanding musical identity. So actually understanding who you are as a music fan and then personalizing to you in a way that right now is still really pretty primitive. So our ability to understand who you are as a music fan in the morning, on a morning run, while you're at work, at night, today all of that is really handled in the UI, where you as a fan have to express your intent in that UI. I think over the next com coming couple of years, we have the ability to understand who you are and your different modalities of listening over time and do that without you having to do anything expressly. So I think in the area of music discovery and personalization, um, we'll be getting it right where you don't even need a UI to express your intent or to basically for us to intuit what, you're, what you want to listen to and when. We're not there yet, but I think that's where some of the most interesting work in the space is. So do you think, you know, one of the things about the way that music used to be discovered is that it was primarily pushed to us. You know, I would sit down in front of my TV and somebody made a choice for me. I would go to a record shop and by virtue of the fact that it's a physical place that had limited you know, shelf space, somebody would choose the records that they would stock. It seems today that too much work is required from, you know, from me as a listener. It's almost like, gee, I don't want to bother. Um, curious to hear, hear your thoughts. I mean, our service is asking too much of us right now. And is, is hand-picked curation really where, where this is going, just in a, in, a, in, a, in a different way than it used to be? I think I, so. I think hand handpicked curation is uh, important to a degree. So, you know, I, I look back on you know just just how I've discovered music over the course of my life, and it's been everything from uh, you know relationships with my friends and people that I trust uh, as far as their musical tastes. Um, it's been the right place, right time, finding music that really worked for me. Um, and you know, so I think I think that there is something to be said about a lean back experience where somebody is is, is telling you what to listen to. Um, but what's really unique about that is, you know, in the, in the move from, you know, kind of programmed terrestrial radio where I'm fed a bunch of content, um, a lot of these platforms are allowing me to, um, you know, personalize it to a degree. So I can skip a song. I can, uh, you know, uh, choose a path and a destination that I want to go to um, based on what I'm liking at the time. So I think that's something that's really uh, interesting and that's, that, that's changing. Um, and you know, I think just in general, what's happening is, um, you know, in the digital music revolution, all of a sudden we have access to millions and millions of tracks, billions of tracks, right? If you want to take a bunch of content that's mm -hmm. coming through, you know, YouTube and um, you know, right. uh, SoundCloud and a lot of independent artists. Um, what's going to happen, I think, is right now everybody's really focused on, on, on personalization, so uh, finding music that's right for me. Um, at Sonos, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to bring the listening out loud revolution back. Uh, everything's really gone to personal devices and personalization and earbuds. Um, we believe that, you know, the, that, that social listening experience is also incredibly important. So you can imagine a world in three to five years where uh, we do get super personalized based on recommendations, but then uh, say the four of us are hanging out and we're listening to music through Sonos, um, the ability to create playlists that may connect all of the, all of the, the content that we might like um, and create a, a, you know, a, a, a listening experience that's based not just on what I like or you like, but something that connects all of us. Yeah, and, yeah just like, to yeah. add to that, it's like, it still amazes me like 
When I was growing up, when I was, whenever I was listening to the radio, there was a song I couldn't stand or didn't like. You'd have to change the station, right? And you would have to change the entire context of what you wanted to listen to. Nowadays, you get your like or dislike buttons, and you augment the station. So you're per personalizing stations for the user, each individual. So, you know, like at Songbiz, we have, I don't know, 550,000 bands. A bunch of them are awesome. I don't even know how many songs YouTube has. I mean, what, what's the number? Millions upon millions. Millions upon millions. You know, Echonus, I'm sure you guys have analyzed, I don't know how many millions of... Uh, About 40 million. 40 million songs. Yet, the truth is I keep hearing from people, I can't find any good music anymore. And again, I think there's a bit of a divide, you know, between digital natives, which are, let's say, people under 30, and then people who kind of grew up in, in a hybrid world like me, and then anybody who's over the age of you know, 45, 50. Why the hell is that the case? Like, so there's all these songs out there, your people still complain they can't find good music. It's, it's, it's hard. Uh -huh. <laughs> but mean, why is it hard? It's hard because this space has gone from a terrestrial radio station. So we power Clear Channel, we power Sirius XM, two kind of traditional terrestrial radio type programming services. Typical station in rotation, like eligible for rotation in a typical format, 300 to 800 songs. 300 to 800 songs. Now you show up and give those guys 30 million songs and say, figure it out. It's going to take some time to figure that out. And we are still in the very early stages. And I think we've, we've come up with ways for a listener to express intent through thumbs up, thumbs down, through artist song seeds, now through moods and other type of context to get closer to understanding that content in that, in that individual. But I think it's, it's healthy to recognize that we'll look back five years from now on where we are now and recognize that we were just getting going. I mean, it's a huge, very interesting and complex data problem, and we're just getting started on trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on, on the panel around this? Well, yeah, just to kind of, again, you know, uh, you know, what Jim is talking about here, I do believe we're really at the beginning. And you know, five years from now, um, imagine all of us having a music profile in this room. Um, and uh, that intelligence may be able to choose a song that every single one of us likes. And that's actually pretty amazing. That's really connecting. So if you want to do that tomorrow, <laughs> Thor, raise your hand. Thor, are you here? He's right there. So if you want to try to do that tomorrow with our Taste Profile API, some people have built hacks to do that. Yeah. Thor's going to do that tomorrow. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thor, Thor could help you if you'd like to try. So you know, uh, there's been a whole lot of debate about the way that music is going to be monetized uh, in, in the future. Everybody knows about the, the, the big changes that the music industry has undergone. Have we settled the whole you know, streaming download uh, argument? Uh, is iTunes radio effectively a validation of, of the streaming model? Uh, where do you think the whole monetization of the recorded experience, I'm not going to talk about live, but the recorded experience is, is I, going? I personally think that there will always be additional revenue streams. I think that um, you know, there's physical um, purchases, there's st and the digital marketplace is a uh, is, is still thriving. Um, additionally, you have subscription models uh, as, as an additional source of revenue for content owners and licensors. Um, do I think that, um, I think the one thing that validates uh, the direction of where this is all going is the first uh, signs of growth in, in monetization in the last several years. And that's coming from all of these new services bringing the access model to the user. So people who weren't spending $10 a month or even $10 a year on music are now doing so because they can get this music library card where they can gain access to millions upon millions of tracks and discover new music. So right now, um, I see music discovery as being the, the way for, for users and for, um, for musicians, for content owners to actually get their revenue uh, back up again. So, I mean. So Sonos, there's a local library listening, but the majority of listening is streaming through services. Is that? Yeah. So as far as usage is concerned, um, you know, just to, to give a little bit of background. So I, I came to Sonos. I was at I was in the record business for you know eight and a half years, uh, trying to solve um, you know the problem. I I, I came in when uh, recorded music sales were uh, in a nosedive. 
And uh, you know, we, we had uh, companies that, you know, such as iTunes selling you know, digital downloads, but I really saw the future in streaming um, because to me that access model uh, made a ton of sense. Um, so when I saw that um, you know, Sonos was actually, um, Sonos plus a music service is like absolutely this most, the most magical experience, right? So um, you know, to have Sonos and access to your, lo to your local library, your own content's great, but having Sonos plus you know, 30 million tracks at your fingertip is even better. Um, and then companies that are helping to curate and tell, you know, tell us what we should be listening to, I think it's, I think it's wonderful. Um, I, I think absolutely uh, we will be moving in the direction of a, of a streaming uh, world. So just like you get a, uh, you know, you get a high definition television, uh, you, know, you, you have cable packages or Netflix or something to provide content uh, through, uh, through, you know, through that experience. Uh, as more and more people adopt, you know, high quality home audio experiences, it's going to be, you know, absolutely makes sense to pay that $10 a month or have a different type of an access model to get content. So, you know, we started years ago where people would go to a store and plug whatever, $12 down to buy an LP. Then at some point it was $18 to buy a CD. I still can't figure that out. Then it became, you know, a dollar to buy a song, and now it's pennies for every song of yours that's getting streamed, if, if you're lucky. Where do you think monetization is going? You know, is, is crowdfunding the, the, the next wave of, of, of monetization for the artist? Is that the new act of buying a record? You know, I was talking to a prominent you know, music industry executive, and he was telling me, gee, it's just so hard today to sort of read user intent. It used to be that mm -hmm. if you bought a ticket for a concert, yeah. or if you bought a record, that was a that was voting for the band, right? Mm -hmm. And that was you know a, a, a big deal because I'm I'm putting you know my hand in my pocket and I'm actually paying for something. Now you know streaming is a bit of a passive experience. I'm not really doing anything. So I, I'm curious to get your your thoughts around sure. where this is going. And if I'm an artist, how am I going to make? you know, my money, especially if my song is one out of 40 million right. that exists out there. Good luck making any money from anybody streaming my music. Well, so I came from music school, so I'm, I'm very close with my friends that are musicians so uh, you're and a Berkeley artists. Guy. I'm, I'm a Berkeley guy. Okay. But um, so the way I look at it and um, my peers look at it is that these are additional revenue streams. Like, so crowdfunding the production of an album and uh, making it available for purchase. To me, that's... Um, that's a, another direct-to-consumer or direct-to-fan experience. Um, that's direct sales from an artist to their users and to their community. That's something that has been done before, but this is this kind of like, you know, shrinks the gap between uh, you know getting your content to the user. Um, now, on on the other hand, switching a, to the other revenue model we were talking about is, let's say you wanted to get your music on on YouTube. Um, that's another way to monetize your content. Um, yes, the business model is different from when you, if you were going to sell a song or sell an album, but in this case, you're making money off of advertising, um, and uh, in the long run, um, you're accruing, you know, if you're that kind of artist, millions upon millions of views, mm -hmm. and you're making money on top of your, your digital sales, on top of your, your touring, so. Yeah, I think it's to start, I think as a former music lawyer, you got to acknowledge, or I would acknowledge that right now, from a streaming standpoint versus physical retail, it's, it's a massive hit. Like, it, it, we may get there, but it's a massive hit. Um, I think from a technology standpoint, the idea uh, that everyone in this room right now has a taste profile, your Spotify listening activity, your YouTube listening ac activity on your local library, on, that, on, on, your, on your mobile device right now, um, and services are starting to understand applying that taste profile to better segment those audiences. And that is an incredibly powerful revenue generation tool. The number one issue in touring, Live Nation, is ticket yield. It's shows that don't get sold out. Now, if you think about a world where, from a streaming consumption standpoint, you're able to tell in market the highest intensity of preference fans in that market for that band or prospective fans, from a targeting and, and merchandising standpoint, that's an enormous opportunity. We aren't exactly there yet, but it's starting to happen. You're starting to see partnerships between on-demand services like YouTube or, or Spotify or RDO and other revenue streams like, like touring and ticketing and merch. 
And it's still early, but there are, there are real opportunities there. They're not there yet, though. So now it is a very, if you're an artist manager or a touring artist, it's a tough time. And also, sorry to add really briefly, like a billion monthly users for YouTube. Where can you get that kind of audience um, you know, for, for, any type of, uh, for t any type of artist? You can get your content to a billion people. Totally. And I mean, maybe to jump in, I'll, I'll say that you know, it used to be that as the, you know, if I was an independent artist, there was absolutely no way for me to be anywhere close to the same level of distribution as the average major label artist. Now, if I'm on YouTube, I have at least equal access to some degree, and it's up to me to get that, you know, that audience member's attention. Exactly. And it's a, perfect, it's, it's a really strong a &R tool, was, still is, mm -hmm. and uh, definitely has more potential. Um, but for, um, for artists to not only break through on a single platform, um, they can also flourish on that platform through monetization and ad-supported um, channels. And, and I guess to ask you a question for a minute, another, part of that is if you're able to generate that audience, and even if direct monetization of that audience is limited, if you're able to communicate that you resonate with that audience to brands, sync licensing, et cetera, yeah. that's a new revenue stream that you guys are actually... Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, we're, we're seeing you know, big consumer brands, whether it's you know, Red Bull or even companies like Renaissance Hotels and Marriott, uh, they're all jumping into this whole world partially because they know that music really resonates with a very highly desirable consumer, you know, a, a young, early adopting, trend setting, digital native. And they realize that through this connection that artists, especially independent artists, have with their audience, this is a great way for them to push their marketing message in an indirect way using these bands as primarily sort of a viral, you know, marketing ambassador. So actually, from my perspective, I see consumer brands being part of this new class of curators that's you know coming about, and you know on Sonic Biz we've we've worked with Red Bull where you know one uh, completely unsigned artist got to play the David Letterman show. You know when I was a talent agent prior to starting the company 13 years ago, I would get down on my knees and beg for any of my artists to play you know the David Letterman show. So certainly we're seeing this collaboration between consumer brands and emerging music, uh, really giving kind of a new. Uh, new ways of, of music discovery that you know didn't quite exist or you know to my example on, on Marriott hotels or Renaissance hotels They're saying we want our brand to be synonymous with discovery So we don't want you know cheesy Whitney Houston cover bands in the lobby We want awesome emerging bands in the lobby because we want to appeal to a particular type of consumer And these are ways for me that are exciting, you know in terms of the new discovery meetings of music um, to, to take it back a, a, a quick step you know, we've all heard the argument of, um, uh, oh, you know, fans are stealing music, stealing music. And I think that's to some degree an argument of a particular, you know, generation. Um, my sort of response to that has been, well, it may be that people are not willing to pay for music the way that they used to or for the exact same good, but their willingness and desire to contribute to an artist and engage and connect with an artist is, is still there. And... To some degree, they're jumping into services like Indiegogo and, and Kickstarter to, to do that. That's their way of sort of owning a piece of that artist, of having that close, intimate connection with, with that artist. Um, how do you guys think the relationship between fan and band is changing with social media and with the ability of the average fan to be so close to their artists? And are you seeing interesting situations where fans and, and bands are co-creating, collaborating, uh, if you will. I'm seeing a lot less gatekeepers nowadays. When I say gatekeepers, I'm thinking um, anything holding the artists back from their fan base or their users. Um, there's always going to be labels, and the, the labels are needed. Um, but um, there needs to be you know, more, uh, more access between the artist, uh, getting their content through, let's say, let's say Vine, let's say SoundCloud, let's say YouTube. You know, there are so many different avenues to get the content to the user. Um, there are different avenues to monetize. Um, but I think nowadays, if, if an artist chooses to say, I just want to use this content, give it to my, user, uh, to my fans for free as promotion, um, they should be able to do that. They should have the freedom. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, you know, piracy is always going to be the enemy. So why not give your fans uh, access to it in a way that's smarter for, for the content owner for the publisher, for the writer, uh, in ways that they can still monetize without just you know, going
going up to whatever pirating site it's going to go up to. Yeah, and to some degree, that's, that's nothing new. I mean, Google's made a multi-billion dollar business by giving something away for free and monetizing the aggregation of the audience that's consuming that something. Right. Right? And not only that, you're getting uh, such valuable um, data and analytics mm -hmm. on who's interested in your, in your content or you. You know, you're getting, um, you're seeing all of the different analytics from uh, various territories. You know, oh, I didn't know that I was big in Greece. Um, maybe I should do a, sh you know, a tour in Greece. You know, it's, um, it's something that um, a lot of people overlook because mm -hmm. it's not just about the raw dollars. It's also about, you know, w the potential of where I can grow. Kristen, any, any more thoughts on this? No, I, I think that, you know, you, you call it potential, I call it opportunity. Um, you know, I think that that's, that's absolutely spot on. So are you guys seeing, you know, I'd love to get your, your take on any new companies that are coming in the scene today that are kind of, you know, you look from afar outside of your own business and say, yeah, these guys are doing something pretty cool and kind of changing the way that music is consumed, music is being distributed, discovered, Love to get your your take on some new stuff that's coming about. Uh, so I'm I'm actually I th I think that you know I think that uh, the music services in general are doing a, a lot of interesting things. Um, quite frankly, I'm very curious to see where the new uh, music service uh, by uh, Beats Audio mm -hmm. is going to go. Uh, you know I feel like they're really approaching um, you know uh, the the curation aspect from um, a unique perspective. Uh, by Can you bring, tell us a bit more about this? I'm not sure if the audience uh, really so, knows about this. So you guys all know Beats Audio, the headphones. I mean, it's pretty much become a fashion statement. Um, Just so, valued at a billion dollars today, by the way. Yeah, wow. so huge, huge company. Um, so they've, they've decided to invest in, uh, in, in uh, a music service. So uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago, they purchased a company called Mog, um, which actually, uh, you know, is a pretty solid music service itself. Um, and they... Uh, are now going to kind of rebrand it, and it will become uh, Beats, you know, the Beats Music Service. So, uh, what they're really going to be heavily focused on is, you know, uh, helping to uh, direct uh, users to the content that they might want. So, uh, they're going to take that, you know, 40 million track catalog and try to make sense of it. Um, you know, not so much that, you know, there will be some, some an algorithmic approach to a degree, but uh, really they're focusing more on curation. You know, they're bringing in um, artists, uh, television personalities, that kind of stuff to uh, help uh, get people get to what they want. So it's not necessarily a completely different approach. It's still this, that same question that, I, you know, had, Jim had mentioned before, we're really at the beginning at. Um, but what they're trying to do is 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 take um, actually kind of take a step back and say you know we are people who have been uh, you know telling people who, what they should listen to for you know because because they're from the record business in the music community um, taking that into into a, a digital music service so I'm just really curious to see you know if that has traction how successful they're going to be at that approach yeah and you know and, and also hearing you guys talk about all this is interesting because you're seeing this concept of customization, that's the, in terms of my music taste, being something that you're also seeing in other industries, you know, like in the, um, in the uh, uh, athletic shoe industry, you know, you have companies like Nike and Adidas mm -hmm. giving you the chance to go and customize your own shoes because people want to feel this is, this is mine, only I have, you know, this shoe. Or, you know, if you walk down to Starbucks, I don't know, I think, I forget how many different permutations of drinks they offer, but people want to customize their drinks. So I think for me, this is a broader societal thing, this concept of I want, you know, I, I often said to people, when I was a kid, I used to identify with music based on what my friends listened to. So if my sister listened to U2, I had to listen to U2. I was the cool in kid because I listened to what everybody else was listening to. Today, you're cool if you listen to something that nobody else knows. And I think this is partially an outcome of, again, social media and the way that people are expressing themselves and maybe the desire you know, among all this noise to kind of stand, you know, to stand out. Um, so it's cool to see that to some degree I can customize my own, you know, my own listings. And we're seeing XM, you know, Sirius XM doing this right now. You can go online and customize your own listening and, you know, things like Daisy or whatever they're going to end up calling the, the yeah. service. Um, cool. I think we have about, is that zero for the panel or zero for the going to the Q&A? Going to Q&A. Oh, thank God. Okay. <laughs> What's a panel without Q&A from the audience? <laughs> Uh, okay, so you all better have some questions, otherwise it's going to be a very silent 20 minutes. Yeah, and if you have a question, there's a microphone either aisle. Oh. 
Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm going to call one of you out. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for an interesting presentation. So my question is this. All this data is being used focused on what an audience wants. Is anybody using this data for artist development? Let's say there is a four musicians sitting around in an apartment in Alston and say, I want to put a band together. Is there any data for them to figure out, geez, there's a market for a band that's a cross between Bob Dylan and Van Halen? There's a market for that? I mean, <laughs> so to you. Kind of. Um, so there are a number of companies that are aggregating all of the listening data out there and giving those, putting those in the hands of, of artists, musicians, management companies, labels to make better sense of, um, of how they reach their audience. Um, Next Big Sound is one in the analytics dashboard space where you can aggregate you know, your listening activity across Facebook. Um, I'm not sure if YouTube is, plays is, is part of it, but there are a number of, of companies that are, that are in that analytics space and analytics tools for artists. Um, I think the, <clears throat> there's still a gap, frankly, I think, between providing that information to an artist or a manager and making it more actionable on some of these services and platforms, largely because most of these services right now, their job is acquiring users and in, in building up an audience that they can monetize. I mean, that's what they're focused on. They have a partnership relationship with, with artists because they're distributing their content. And I think across the board, Spotify, other services, view that partnership with artists very, very, it's important. But from a product standpoint yet, those services are not platforms for artists to have full visibility into the data and actually take action within those services yet. But certainly, you know, behind the scenes, we know that that is part of the product roadmap for some of these services. Yeah, I think so there are standalone players out there, but it's not, it's not all woven together the way it, it ultimately will be. Yeah, and to, to Jim's point, I think there's a lot of services that are trying to offer this information to artists to make better decisions, but I sure as hell hope that no band out there is forming just based on market research. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I sure, you know, I just, I, I tell entrepreneurs, don't start a company because you've done market research, start a company because you're passionate about something. And I, and I think that you know, starting a company or being in a rock and roll band is about the same level of insanity and craziness required. Yeah, maybe you, some boy bands, though. You don't want to. You don't want to go to that festival. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, exactly. And there is always, always, always a steady stream of digital snake oil salesmen who have some kind of technology who can predict a hit or do other things. And not to say that research in those areas isn't interesting and compelling, but there is a line. And uh, there are digital carnies out there who are overselling the promise of technology in building a business as well. And sorting through those can sometimes be difficult. Yes. Um, can you stand up so we can see you and hear you? Yeah. How about reaching musicians in different areas? All of this is very well for technically savvy people. But a lot of times, music talent lies in that little village in India. Or, you know, and what efforts can be done to reach those musicians and get that music onto the platform? Um, yeah, I would love to answer that. Um, I think it's really up. Oh. Okay. I I guess I said, oh, how about? What effort is being done to reach musicians? Because there might be a remote musician in India who's, who's yeah. got fantastic music. And what effort is, you know, can be done to reach those musicians and get that music to this platform in I, some manner? I think it, um, it really has to, the perspective has to come from the other way. I think the musician and the artist really has to grind it out and, and get their content and themselves out to everyone that's listening. Because there's such a... For, it's a needle in a haystack, right, for, for labels or for artist managers to, to find the talent. There's like millions, of, you know, I always say millions upon millions, but it's, it's, really, it's really hard to, ver to zero in on that type of talent. So we have all these tools at our disposal nowadays, though, you know, with the magic of the Internet. We have, we have YouTube, we have SoundCloud. Um, let's, say, let's say you have your content already on those services, right? There are various aggregators um, that are actually looking for artists to, um, to deliver their content. Yes, you have to pay a fee, but what they'll do is that they'll, they'll um, you sign an agreement um, and they get, you hold all of the rights 
You pay this one-time fee. Um, they productize your content for DSPs like iTunes, like Spotify, like YouTube, um, uh, and all others. Um, and that's, that's a way to do it. Um, as a musician now, you have to be as savvy with your instrument um, and, and also equally as savvy business-wise um, and also on an A&R side. So you have to really know, like, where should I be for them to find me? That's, I think that's how you should look at it as, as an artist. The it's one of the most interesting trends in the services that we work with. Um, Nokia, for example, is one of the largest music retailers in India and sees a huge opportunity. They've been acquiring content, localized content in, in India for a long time, and now that's a huge benefit for them when they are in the UK or in other territories because they've got content um, that other services haven't gone and put feet on the ground to go and, and license that content and make it available. A lot of activity in China in the same way. And I mean, there are, there's a much more immediate path, which is to put stuff up on YouTube or SoundCloud or other services. But the streaming services are looking at, um, at regional and global, meaning regional understanding on a global level, which is another big problem. But you're starting to see major investment from a lot of companies there. And, and, you know, the, whereas I don't think we're over that hump yet, I think it's a lot easier today for the average American to discover awesome raga music from India than it was 15 years ago. And I'll tell you, on, on, on a Sonic Bits level, one of the coolest things that I've experienced in the 13 years that I've ran the company is, you know, I, I was in Seville, Spain three years ago, and I met this female Iranian DJ who was playing her first gig out of Iran using Sonic Bids in Seville, you know? Or we had this um, pianist from Iceland who ended up touring China for two weeks. And again, it was a gig that they got through, through the site. So whereas I do often worry about the, the haves and half-nots in an internet world, you know, let's not forget there is a good part of humanity that's still not connected. I think we're a lot closer and the world is a lot flatter and hopefully music is a lot more easier to be discovered today than, than it used to be. I know we have a huge line, yeah. so yes. Uh, first, a quick comment. I think a lot of people fixate on, uh, you know, for an artist, Spotify pays fractions of pennies to you. So, but I think a lot of people forget the other side of the equation of that the, the entry barriers and the cost of production is deflated so much. So I think, I think a lot of people forget that other side of the equation. My quick question was, what are your thoughts on the future of advertising as, a, as it is a part of the business model? I know YouTube relies a lot on it, so does Google and Pandora, and I'm assuming Spotify does as well, but I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on how that fits into the business model for the future of music making. Ron, you want to Yeah, talk so, about okay. First, right? I mean, <laughs> growth, uh, Growth invites growth. So you have a billion users uh, every month. So what does that mean? The more, the more users we get, the more we can charge advertisers to display their ads, right? So the more that we can charge, the more revenue we can generate for our, um, for our content partners. Uh, I know that sounds a little too basic, but it's pretty much how it goes. Um, so the way advertising is now, there's huge growth. Um, the larger the user, user base gets, the more uh, it, it just generates more dollars for, for the content owners. So. And the smarter that your ad platform gets too, right? You'll be exactly. able to re really target and exactly. you know, invest in the ad platform. You can make more money. We have it. several types of uh, advertising products. We have TrueView, the one where it's like everyone's familiar, five seconds, great, now I can skip it. Um, but we also have um, you know, in-stream ads where you, know, you get a 30-second ad. We're, we're used to watching TV and it's like you know, several minutes of advertising. So I think it's a pretty fair shake for the user that's, that's on an advertised platform. Yeah, if you think about it from a technology standpoint, um, music has always been a proxy to audience. And back to the point of musical identity and the fact that everyone in this room is now in a two-way conversation versus radio that was a push where you're expressing who you are. So in terrestrial radio, there's a $15 billion ad industry that basically drops people into one of 12 buckets based on radio format. And now that there's a two-way discussion, our ability to target in a much, much more uh, advanced way is, uh, I think, makes advertising a, a great growth revenue stream for a lot of these services. Thanks. So we have about five minutes. So what I'll do is one question, one panelist, and we'll just keep moving like that. 
And I'll throw the panelists into the den <laughs> okay, after the question. The lion's den. <laughs> um, I am a proponent of digitizing the random act of music discovery. However, I believe that, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, and that's why I'm asking you, the fact that it's so easy to discover new music and that there are like top rated songs of every band makes it kind of um, not as long lasting to discover something. And that's why people are claiming that there's nothing good out there and everything is dull or what, whatsoever. But what do you think is the effect that of technology on our musical discovery? And okay, perfect yeah. question for Jim. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Jim. Uh, <laughs> Just a Saturday, that's, morning, that's what I, that's what Saturday love, morning softball. I love playing the moderator. You know, I'm not, never on the spot. Uh, I think it's kind of true. Uh, I just think that for, anecdotally, solely, that, that we, the Equinus doesn't even treat albums as a full first-class citizen until like just recently because most streaming consumption was much, much more single-driven or playlist-driven. Um, as a musician and as someone that listens to albums still, quote, cover to cover digitally, um, it's something I'm concerned about too. Uh, I think there is some truth to, to, to that. I think people still will connect and resonate with, um, with longer form content and, and will fall in love with artists that they put on autoplay and can't stop listening to. And people are still making concept records and being successful doing so. so I don't think that it's, it's certainly not going to go away, but I think certainly in this explosion of, of consumption that what you're pointing out is it's true to some degree. Thanks. Next question. So I've had this experience with music, and I don't think I'm the only one where sometimes I'll hear a song or an album for the first time and have the, just a visceral negative reaction to it, only to <laughs> later on come to appreciate it. And I kind of wonder, uh, given like like and dislike buttons, isn't that kind of a blunt weapon that sort of kills long-term appreciation of music. Yeah, the, the Ramones would have never, ever, ever been known if the like and dislike buttons were there. Uh, <laughs> Krista, I'd love to get your thoughts. Uh, so the like and the dislike button, um, you know, I think it really depends on how it's applied. Um, so, you know, in the case of, uh, you know, Pandora Station, for example, uh, you know, you might, you might uh, want to go on a certain journey when it comes to the Rolling Stones. You get fed a track. Um, it doesn't really work for you. Um, the, the issue with it, you're right, it does become a blunt, blunt weapon. Um, now if I want to revisit that station and my tastes do change gradually, it's very difficult for me to go back and, and, and make adjustments. Um, the same thing goes for um, the fact of, it, and I touched on before, you know, in, in a world that is so uh, focused on mobile and these one-to-one -one relationships with music services, um, if I have people over my house and um, I want to have people add to a queue, I want to have people participate in social listening, all of a sudden all of my algorithms get screwed up because you might have put on your favorite like One Direction song. And uh, <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and then my recommendations you know, are, are you know, suddenly I'm being fed a bunch of music that I, that I don't um, want. So uh, again, I think there's a tremendous amount of work that still needs to be done. Um, and, mm -hmm. and again, we're we're at the beginning, um, and it will develop over the next few years. We'll yeah, and, and, and also, you know, let's not forget that there's certain genres of music that unfortunately are not yeah. really well positioned uh, for this new world, like classical music. I think it's awfully hard to discover classical music in yeah. today's you know, ecosystem. Yeah. Um, next question. Hey, um, I miss MTV. Um, you know, the, the experience of actually collectively synchronized experiencing something new, I think is something that's neat. And I, while I love all these kind of curated and auto-curated videos, uh, playlists, and audio playlists, I think there should be something out there where people can actually just experience them at the same time. So you can log in, it's effectively radio. And I kind of, you know, this kind of idea of things being called radio, like iRadio, I don't like the, that idea because you can skip that. And that's something that I don't feel radio is. Radio is something where people log in and listen to what's currently playing rather than a playlist that they can skip through. Is there a question though that goes? I think it's just generally like, do you think that there's a place? Because it's one of the ideas I was thinking about for this event is to actually create something that's synchronized. So I'll throw this to Ron since you're Mr. Yeah. Uh, at 21st <laughs> century MTV. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, when it comes to MTV, I mean, I grew up on it. And um, uh, there was an article, gosh, I, I think it was uh, New York Times or Wall Street Journal saying that like, 
instead of saying I want my MTV, it's now I want my YouTube. And I'm sorry to you know self promote here, but it's I mean like where people it's it's where people go um, for cure, um, original music content. We have channels like like um, Noisy, like Thump, like um, uh, who else? Vice. We have Vivo if you want to get your top you know top 40 videos. And um, but we also have some really unique, um, not just label artists. We have venue channels where, like, if you want to see live performances of like your favorite, you know, New York venue, like I don't know, Jazz at Lincoln Center. Um, it's a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool channel. Um, it's out there. It's not going to be on one station like it used to be, but I find that fun. You, it's you, you, the, you, it's up to the user to subscribe to these different music channels. But I think, then, I think my point is that um, anybody observing that playlist can mm -hmm. skip throughout it, so there's no kind of collected experience. The, the, there's a trade-off with interactivity, but I think Vivo's a good example. Vivo, which houses most of the kind of major label music videos on YouTube, just launched broadcast linear stations to deliver that type of experience. Okay. Right. Yeah, and I mean, the they're going to do more of that yeah, for exactly that. Yeah, the collective experience, I mean, that's, that's, that's when something goes viral, right? That's when you have that video that everybody that must see. So still a tremendous amount of investment in, in creating the visual aspect of, of music. Yeah, and uh, just to add to that, we're doing some really cool things with live events. So um, Jay-Z and Pearl Jam just had their second um, Made in America uh, event in Philadelphia. And that was streamed live. Um, you know, it was just, um, they just ran it. You couldn't skip through it. It's just a constant live feed. So, I mean, that's something that, um, you know, uh, you won't be able to find on MTV anymore. So, unfortunately, we have one more minute unless we can do 10 seconds per question. We're not going to get to everybody. One word. So, <laughs> unfortunately, this is our last question. Okay, so, hi, my name is Anna, and I'm very interested in the connection between the bands and the audiences. So, sometimes, for example, I've been in live concerts and been really excited but then very disappointed because I didn't like the live show. So I was thinking about better ways of connecting the audiences and the bands. And, and my question is, is there, for example, any way, uh, any company that already does that of communicating, um, direct communication without being t Twitter, but a way of communicating with the bands in which you could, for example, say, hey, in this concert, I really want, to, want you to play this certain song. And so the, the band gets all the statistics all together without being like Twitter, just yeah, I, I don't, organized I don't, I'm not familiar with a service like this. I, I think for me, the closest to that is, is Twitter. You know, ultimately, I, I feel that it's the closest you have to real time feedback as an artist. Um, it, you know, to sort of observe audience reactions in real time. I'm not sure necessarily if that's a do good thing Do you think or that's thing. enough, or do you think it would be valuable for the bands to actually know exactly what the uh, audiences of a certain geography, a certain age, sort of are looking for the live shows? And also have a way of communicating with them real life? There, there's, there's a few services. One is called Bands in Town, where you can actually sort of demand a concert, if you will. Yeah. Um, so the, and, and there's others uh, that, that do this. And I, 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 but if, is there one company that gives you both instantaneous feedback and also gets the audience to demand a band to come and play in their local town? I'm not familiar with it. But you know, there is a mosaic of companies out there that, that, that do this. But, I find you know, Twitter to be a fairly powerful tool in, in an artist's uh, toolkit today with respect to audience interaction and conversation. Um, just really yeah. quick, sorry. Um, so I also think that it's a bit raw, but Reddit is becoming very, um, very savvy. I mean, they had Barack on there. They, they're getting a lot more celebrities to do a Ask Me Anything session. So if you had you know, an artist do a show in your local area, have, have them set up you know, and Ask Me Anything either before or after that show, and that's just you know direct feedback, and I think that's something uh, worth looking into. It's still very raw nowadays because like, you know, it's very, it's a little too casual. But I like how we're referring to our president by the first name, Barack. Barack. I don't know cool. any other Barack's. I don't you know George and <laughs> Bill. Everybody at Google does that. Yeah, exactly. They all know him. <laughs> all know him. Uh, cool. Well. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I, we really needed probably like three hours to have this awesome conversation. But thanks to everybody for coming so early in the morning.